on our current project, we look at what the impact of regulation is basically on venture capital. And of course, the hypothesis is here that when you when, when the market is regulated, the venture capital flows change to a certain degree. And I mean, at this point, it's super interesting what's happened in China because we're in a situation that never happened before. So basically, to start off the topic, I mean, today, we would love to talk about policies, regulation and more, question mark, yeah? and how volatility affects confidence in Chinese ventures. Obviously, this topic is, is built on, on multiple pillars. The first one is obviously the, the policies that have been in place in the past. The second one is the new policies that actually um, added to that. And the third pillar is basically how this affects the business landscape. That means corporate entrepreneurship, but also yeah, in, internal and external. That means venture capital and also transformation. But we especially look at uh, venture capital at the moment because obviously investments change and also confidence changes, right? Confidence is a big word here. Confidence in certain industry changes because people and international investors especially become more aware of what is actually possible and possibly to be disrupted. And you're yeah. also taking a look at the corporate venture capital, right? Right, right. right, right Which right. is also your expertise in your research. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're looking at corporate venture capital or investments over time. And also we look at who are the big players here, where they invest in, what are the, the overlaps between different industries and investments. So, for example, where we have the most the most overlap in the investors, for example, is there a high overlap maybe in electric cars and AI? I could imagine that's the case, especially as now, for example, Xiaomi and F. AW, which is a Chinese car company, are now partnering up to to basically build the future the future car. And so you see the VC investments obviously are like an innovation radar. So you basically understand where people where companies are investing in, especially corporates, to see what the future could like, be like. Because the, inve- the, the innovation and the patterns they invest in is something that is that is the truth of tomorrow, right? Hmm. So it's uh, very interesting to understand the wind direction. So what yeah. kind of policies and regulations did you find that we should talk about? So basically the, the Chinese basically the Chinese industrial landscape has been repeatedly unsettled by various disruptions in recent years. And uh, also the omnipresent corona pandemic since 2019, the restrictions of online gaming in January 2022, uh, the people, which is a personal data regulation legislation that has basically been impacting supranational uh, collaborations all over the place in China since November 2021, and also the delegalization of non-state cryptocurrencies, which really cut into uh, what's possible with blockchain and limited blockchain to industrial applications and uh, basically forbid DeFi, uh, DeFi gaming. Uh, since September 2021, also the regulation of private education in July 2021. And uh, in addition to that, the new antitrust rules of China's internet industry in March 2021 as well, in combination with the three red lines policy since this is continuing since August 2020, which basically brought the widespread financial consequences with the fall of Evergrande later as a, as a, as a fact trickled down. And all these things together basically make for a really volatile, uncertain a complex and ambiguous environment. And we see those results basically now in the Chinese market as companies change away from being dynamic as they have been before to more being reactive to, to what, what mm. has to happen in the market. And it's, it's interesting how the venture capital deals have been really on the top of the game in 2021 and 2022. They, they really like uh, reached uh, a tipping point and really went, went down, especially for some of the entertainment industries, education, tech, for example, where really we had, we saw the regulations really decourage, discouraged uh, investors. There's mainly consumer, isn't it? I think that all these regulations are mainly happening in the consumer space, like all the areas that you just mentioned, gaming, blockchain, right. well, blo- blockchain di- like differs, but cryptocurrency, yeah, e-commerce, social media, I think there was like yeah. many consumer businesses. There's not so much regulation happening in hardware, which I also find interesting. Yeah. 
for example, when talking about the education example, did you actually like hear, hear more about it? I found that quite interesting because they basically made it harder for education businesses, especially for tutor classes or extra curricular activities to sell to the consumer because they wanted to lower the competition between students. And they also don't like these businesses to have these high, high, uh, high prices. They, they want to have equal rights for everybody, for every student. And this is interesting because at the same time, like this is how China is, right? It's highly competitive. And also the competition has led to this innovation cycle and to these highly innovative businesses. I was expecting the education space to be touched latest, but so I, I was quite surprised actually. But yeah, as you said, like it's hitting many different areas and many different fields. You never know where it happens, right? Th that's the point that makes it so, so volatile, basically. So China has become a turbulent market where you don't really know what the future looks like. And, and instead of being like in the past, we were just like more well, serious preaching, oh, be ambidextrous it means kind of balance two things. On the one hand, optimize local operations or optimize your, your company operation. On the other hand, look kind of what is happening in the market, feel for it, feel the water temperature, and then you need to do some R&D, you need to buy some ventures. But this is the way it worked in the West and the counter literature and the dexterity is actually very successful. But if you now look at the Chinese market, there's more of a trend to, to, to risk management and kind of a reactive behavior. You just have to like put out fires. <laughs> you never really know what happens because it's, it, it, nobody was, see, was able to see that coming. I mean, even like yeah. being connected in the industry, like nobody knew that they would regulate education now. It's like now limited to adult education. And this this this, uh, this regulation, basically, and uh, I mean, there's policy and the regulation that followed, but also in, in combination with, with all this other stuff, that's, for example, the, the, the regulation towards COVID, that it was a temporary regulation, really made the market unpredictable. And people are just now asking, okay, is it really so good to, like, have my, if I want a stable investment to go into China? Because it seems to be really, the next day it could completely change like it could be a completely different animal, right? Yeah. It's also about, like when I did my, my research, I also found that investors are particularly concerned about the government getting too involved. Like first, it's the regulations that the, that the government imposes on businesses, which might force them into a different directions. And then like direct involvement can also happen. So they could basically end up having a completely different business model. So if an investor, let's say a venture capital fund takes them and says, okay, this is a business model that we think might scale big. And then there's a, a pivot, a bit bigger pivot this influences the whole investment. I mean, the current market is characterized by, by a restricted technology industry as well as a more difficult access to capital, for sure. And uh, what we see, that especially in the sectors favored by the government, high investments are, are still flowing and are more stable. So in line with, uh, with China's five-year plan, Fordin's five-year plan, 2021 to 2025, basically investments still seem to, to go fairly undisrupted. That means that China VCs focus most on industry sectors with long-term potential. This includes high-tech manufacturing, as we discussed in our last episode, artificial intelligence robotics, healthcare, sustainable... Semiconductors also. Yeah, semiconductors also. Yeah, we could put them in the box of, 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 of advanced manufacturing to some degree, but yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Hardware, hardware products and electromobility, sustainable energy, which includes surprisingly a very ambitious goal for another 150 atomic stations until 2060 and i'm not completely mistaken so very high ambitions here on atomic energy to be yeah to to, to burn less coal and less be less polluting and e-commerce especially fueled by by 5g and home shopping right also really really increase that trend by, by, the, by the pandemic, right? Because people uh, see the potentials of e-commerce. Hmm. But I find interesting that there's the hardware shift that we were talking about last time, right? Where we're talking about investors intending towards or moving into the industrial space, but also hardware investments where they were formerly focused on e-commerce or internet investments or yeah, or B2B, B2C. So this, you could say, okay, this is influenced by the government because they are setting the five years plan. 
and they are making VCs like follow their instructions and moving into this space. But at the same same point, you could say, and well, this is somehow also my standpoint, that these VCs are also moving into the hardware space to spreading their risk because they cannot be certain how the consumer businesses develop because of the regulations, right? So balancing out the risk, of like investing in some more like stable cash flow, lower valuation companies with smaller amounts that also helps them to, yeah, yeah lower the risks basically. Mm -hmm. I feel like the secondary industries will have a more prominent role again in China. As you as you're saying, the consumer or business is basically all the entertainment and education that is directly geared to the, towards the customer is a bit more restricted, especially with big tech also being disrupted in the gaming industry, but it's was an obvious B2C business. So the B2B business here, secondary industries that work with materials is, is obviously getting uh, more emphasis from the government, especially uh, high tech and in the manufacturing space, because this is where China has developed very strong capabilities and where there is a potential to really go forward. So high tech industry that includes uh, um, also electric mobility, that includes manufacturing of uh, semiconductors. That includes, well, that, that include also, let me see, like uh, healthcare innovation, right? Uh, healthcare R&D, where they really want to put their the foot on, on the ground and industrial robots as well. I think I would like to go back to the regulations, which effects they have on the consumer businesses, because I think many of our listeners have heard about the, the Cold War between China and the US, but also this issue with US stock listings, right? Chinese companies listing on the US stock exchange. For mm. example, Alibaba, Didi, there were a few examples like Ant Financial tried to list there. And many might remember that listings were put on hold because US officials wanted to see the financial audits of Chinese companies. They wanted to know, is the government involved? To which extent they wanted to, to do on-site inspections. So um, there was a law in 2009 imposed in China, and this prohibits that these data is handed over to any foreign countries, which puts these startups in a pretty difficult position because they just cannot pursue with this IPO that they're, they're trying to do in the U.S., and this is one thing, but moving to the investor side, also many stock listed companies from China have no chance to further raise funds on the U.S. stock exchange because they cannot hand over these data. And this is also mainly happening in the consumer space because consumer businesses, 97% of them do an IPO. And for them, actually, the U.S. is quite important because at the point when they do the IPO, they are normally still loss-making businesses selling a growth story. And this is a lot easier to U.S. investors. So they can raise higher amounts at very, very high valuations, which they cannot do now. So they are actually missing a lot of money if they can pursue their IPOs. In other stock exchanges, many are moving to Hong Kong, to other Asian markets. But going back to the VC side, if you're invested in such a company, yeah, you can potentially not pursue your exit. And then if they basically go on an IPO only in China, then it's difficult for Western investors to do so. So having access to the American stock market is, is, is really important for companies to really have their global presence, right? So it's a really important, important thing. I totally I'm totally on that boat, yeah. Especially China is really risking with those regulations to become fractured away from the rest of the world. And the more regulations they put in place, for example, the, the, the people law, for example, the personal data regulation legislation is impacting supranational collaborations very fundamentally. Because you see that this data needs to be shared at the, at the back end to the Chinese government. And sometimes it's just something that is not possible in international collaborations because you really don't, don't, don't want that or it's something that companies prefer not to do, something like that. So it's, it's, it's really difficult to, to, to convince companies, okay, if I need to share it with the government, do I really do that? And I'm not sure if the Chinese government, with this autocratic top-down approach, if it's really like helping the country be on the forefront or basically they, they're taking a, a step back. So from my perspective, it remains questionable whether the Chinese top-down approach can really be the fruit in increasing the disruptive 
in an increasingly disruptive environment, especially for the, the high-tech innovations topic, the choice of directions is often difficult and risky. And directions from experienced VC fund partners is often necessary to be properly positioned in the complex landscape. So yeah. having this, this top-down approach could also really hamper how, how the country is moving forward. So it, 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 I think it's, it's not mm. able to answer that yet, but in the future we can see did this pass a China choose now improve innovation in certain areas or did it overall just de decrease innovativeness? I was actually asking myself, why are they imposing certain regulations? Is that mm -hmm. protectionism? Is it because they are worried that other countries might now learn about their competitive advantage as we were worried about China stealing our ideas or innovation? Or what is it really? And I think it's probably a mix, but what also plays a role whenever a startup, for example, IPOs in the U.S., What happens is usually that a lot of value is is flowing into the U.S. A lot of a lot of money is flowing into the U.S. A lot of workforce is also going into the U.S. That's what we as Europeans are usually worried about. That the headquarters need to move into the U.S. Whenever U.S. investors get on board. When it comes to the Chinese structure, I also saw that you were mentioning that before, Kimo. You were saying it's not possible for investors to directly invest in a Chinese business, which is true. There's a structure called variable interest entity, VIE. And this is just like a shell company that Chinese startups install in the U.S., to be able to list on the stock market. So whenever you're an investor in a Chinese startup, you are basically only an investor in this shell company. And then the, there's the operational Chinese entity, which is also making it really risky for investors to invest in a Chinese startup. And this structure was also shaped by the Chinese. No workforce is drifting to the U.S. There's a lot of protectionism going on here. But at the same point, it's it's a loophole for businesses that have been regulated, like blockchain or gaming or whatever. They sometimes decide to just move on to the U.S. and wait before regulations are lowered and then potentially come back to China. Far ahead and, and basically applying robotics and, and e-commerce in, in one way that we've seen even during the pandemic, robots delivering meals, for example, that you ordered online. In the West, there, is, there are so many like things that why it wouldn't work because there are so many regulations in place already that don't they don't let it that this, this work out right. You, you, feel, yeah. feel, you see, for example, in in Shenzhen, they are now basically discussing to open the main streets, which is like the highway streets in the city or the main street, to open them for autonomous driving. That means robo taxi, mm -hmm. automatic too, delivery, yeah. right? And I really uh, need to go there to see that myself. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, definitely should. I mean, I also have to go. I have to see that really. And then, I mean, I think in Beijing, there are also some dedicated routes that are already available for autonomous driving. And this is the things the government just says you can really do ground innovations to in a really fast scale manner. And, and this is uh, the venture capital is, is still very inter interesting. As long as it's aligned with a uh, economic goals of the, with the Chinese government, but then you can really do whatever you want. Yeah, that's the perfect summary. If you look at both worlds like that, sometimes innovation is even easier and companies are even faster if, yeah, there is a clear guideline and there's a lot of governmental regulations, etc., or the government is even involved. There's so much happening and I think that it's just a very successful model, right? So we need to monitor it further. It will definitely be quite an interesting race ongoing with businesses in Europe and in the US and in China. Absolutely. Yeah. I also think it's, it's interesting to watch to which degrees the companies that have now been disrupted are actually opting for internal innovation and trying to, to change their business model around with their own capabilities or going to look for and for investments into into companies that actually are, are there to their portfolio and can actually 
helps them build like a helps them learn through an innovation ecosystem. So it's interesting how to to watch now how those Chinese companies are also reacting to those disruptions. I think it goes more in the direction of of collaborations with universities, for example. Government announces something, then everybody jumps onto this new guideline, and then the quickest is the will potentially win the race. I think it's really about building those reactive capabilities, and this could be through internal partnership, but also through venture capital. So I think this is where the trend is going and being more aligned with the with government, a government trend with a five-year plan and not playing outside of that box. Because if you, as soon as you play outside of the, fi of the five-year plans uh, announced, announced goals, you're just risking all like, mm -hmm. maybe I'm just going to be regulated next because it's not really aligned with what the government is doing and we really don't know what the government wants to regulate. And it's sometimes no, it's, it's not... It's not rational, right? It's not. It doesn't seem rational. Maybe it's rational on the long term. For example, why would you regulate gaming hours to three hours? I think three hours a day, and then on the weekend you may have four hours a day, or, or it's even less. So you re-regulate gaming for for kids. It's like there's no direct connection to the economic productivity. But then you think about it, price is like okay, now kids are forced more to learn for school. This is like what the government is thinking. So it's like you get really this is twisted thinking. And many, many people, I have a friend who basically made an AI startup and, has, and they want to collaborate with, with, with the younger generation as well. And now they have to focus on adult education because that's the only thing that's basically left and the other thing basically got regulated by the government because you can't like extra charge for education. And because you have this, the interests of the political interests that are, that are playing against what is also possible to innovate. And those things, of course, are unheard in the West. Nobody could like regulate gaming hours in the West without like a huge... No way. No way, right? You know, you could, like, people would get angry and just get reversed in one day. Like, this is unimaginable, right? Wow. But, no. but the gaming industry per se, like, they, they cannot, like, they must be somehow also cautious to not over-regulate the gaming industry because they still need them for the metaverse, right? Because one of the reasons no. that China is leading the metaverse and the industrial metaverse movement is also because they are so great uh, in the gaming sector and in virtual reality and augmented reality stuff. So definitely one of the areas where they need businesses to pursue what they are doing to then later maybe move into this new space that they have on the five years plan. Well, it's it's very interesting how 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 different how different structures and different approach top down approach of the Chinese government is is actually a counter model to what was in the West in the West and also seeing that Still it's working fine, yeah. I'm, I'm always very impressed how they can structure these topics in such a very detailed way, right? If you dig, dig deep into these uh, five years plan and then they usually have their other plans and other uh, papers on where they detail it more and more like you have the top KPIs, the overall KPIs, but then they have very detailed KPIs for every level of governments or also businesses. Like it's it's quite impressive. I, I wouldn't know any experts in the West or any expert network that would be able to do such a thing. And I think it also is the case because they, they're able to recruit the top two percent of of students for the party, right? They I'm not sure if, if you know that. They actually recruit the new party members out of the two percent of university students, and these two percent are obviously like the best, best, best students. And then they have a rotating like system where like party members are first put into one position and then they are moved into, for example, from Shanghai to the countryside in a completely different field. So in a short period of time, they see a lot of different topics. They have to solve a lot of different issues because it's the cleverest and smartest people. This is why they are able to understand all these different sectors and all these different fields so well. I mean, it's definitely like to just say this two more sentences. It's definitely also a cultural thing here. China, in China, is often that people are faced with a problem. They're just like, and they, they tell their the kids already, okay, solve this problem and not right. like try to or find a, a new new way to do it. Like, or yes, find a new way to solve that specific problem, but don't like do something else. Just do, do, do this specific thing, but then try any any means possible to solve this specific problem. And I think that that, that kind of also draws into this five-year plan of being, okay, they're cutting complexity at the at the at the at the ground level right they're cutting the complexity they're encouraging collaborative knowledge sharing on topics that are interesting for the five year plan and this mm -hmm. collaborative knowledge sharing makes it it's possible to like really like also not start at zero like many entrepreneurs 
and innovators and other firms do because they're competing all the time, right? Mm -hmm. There's more of a collaborative environment for the specific topics. And then you really got a head start and you can solve on this specific problem. And I, I find that, that this gives people like more time uh, to, to spend on the specific problem and less time maneuvering to, to find a niche that they should focus on. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you very much, Kimo. It was a lot of fun, like always. Same for me. Um, Thank you, Betty. I think it was a good summary, a good uh, transition. Yeah, now we will be um, live again in two weeks' time. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for your time, as always. Very interesting discussion. I hope our listeners also enjoyed as much as we did. Yeah.